everyone, including the latecomers, that we're enjoying the music outside. So I'm going to talk about the past and present of the Linux NVMe driver, and it's been there for a while. Now, now I'm one of the co-maintainers, and I'm also active in the NVMe technical working group, hassling all the device and standards people to think of our as poor host people that actually have to deal with drivers. And well, what's a driver? Everyone will know, and if you think of golf right now, you're in the wrong room. Um, so, piece of computer software that controls input and output. Sounds harmless, huh? But, but uh, could be a whole lot of different things. So just if we're, we're sticking to storage drivers, because we're all storage people, and, and look at good old SCSI, could have a tiny little driver like the Vertio SCSI for virtual machines, which is including the header, uh, 1,300 lines of code, or we could be three orders of magnitude bigger for a nice little fiber channel driver that everyone loves. So, well, drivers can be quite a lot of different things. So, could be lots of different hardware types, like if you have seven generations of different hardware in the same driver, it's going to be big. If you support an initiator and a target and SCSI and NVMe in one driver, well, it's going to be big and uh, all these factors multiply. So if we're, we're moving to NVMe drivers, um, this could look a little different too. So if we go back to Linux 4.4, our NVMe driver was about 7.5K lines of code split over a few files. Actually, in 4.12, it got a lot smaller, which is interesting. But that's because uh, at that point, we actually had two drivers. And in the end, it's actually more. It's just uh, the one that's actually driving the little PCIe device you think of when NVMe. Um, it's a lot smaller. And either way, we're doing pretty good compared to other NVMe drivers. So if I look at the open source OFED Windows driver, it's getting closer to our fiber channel monster on the Linux side, and it actually has a lot less functionality, which is pretty interesting. Um, so the, the humble beginning of our little baby, the NVMe driver, was uh, our friend and colleague Matthew Wilcox back in the day, early 2011. And if you look at the lines of code, the two files um, down here, it's actually pretty much exactly the size as our Vertio SCSI example for trivial little driver. The other interesting thing when looking at that commit in, in GitWeb is if you look at the date of the commit, that was actually a month before the NVMe 1.0 spec got released. So someone had a head start in there. Um, so if you look at this, this very first commit, it was very little in there. In fact, in some ways, it doesn't really look at what uh, your friendly marketeer will tell you about NVMe. So there was only single submission queue, single completion queue, only did small data transfers, so only up to a single page size of actual data transfers. Just did a read and a write and a few admin commands. So it was, was tiny, simple, and didn't actually work. So uh, it took a couple more iterations before it was even in a shape to get merged into the Linux kernel. So January 2012, one year exactly. And at that point, it started to resemble what we think of as NVMe. So got multiple queue support, basically one per CPU. It was pretty strict about that. It didn't really work well at that point if you had less queues than CPUs. Um, it supported late, larger data transfers, lots and lots of fixes, and it grown about 800 lines of code. So, uh, well, quite a bit bigger than before. Well, we had that that driver in the mainland Linux kernel. There was still no NVMe product on the market by then. So just a couple prototypes and labs, giant FPGAs. I think Martin had one of those and really loved it. Um, and continued like that basically until uh, got a few products on the market, got lots of little bug fixes and a couple features that are not too major but interesting. So we got support for the NVMe deallocate command, what we Linux people know of as discards, so telling a device that that data had a bunch of LBAs, it's not needed anymore, go reclaim it, optimize your garbage collection. Uh, actual support for cache flushing, which was committed before it first got into the Linux kernel, actually started working because someone tested it with a device that had a volatile write cache, which they probably didn't do before. 
um, we got a feature that has been really useful, and that is the uh, character devices. So normally, if you talk about block storage in Unix systems, you've got your block device node that you do the actual I.O. on, which for NVMe, we've got one per namespace. But if you want to actually do administrative and um, set up things, we've got a nice little user space NVMe CLI tool that allows you to basically exercise every NVMe command. And for that, we have a character device handle that offers the IOCTAL to do it, which is really useful if you, say, have a drive that doesn't have any namespaces. There's not going to be a block device node for it. Um, or you have a really broken device that doesn't come up and can't create IO queues, which apparently is a common failure mode for Intel devices, so you could actually bang that back into a shape where you can use it with a firmware update. Then another thing we got in there, which was a little controversial mostly later, is that, that somewhat at Intel, not the maintainer, added a, a weird SCSI translation scheme that you could use the SCSI path through IOCTAL that we have in the SCSI subsystem on the NVMe namespace block device node and it would silently translate it to NVMe commands and submit them. Turns out that code was extremely buggy, had a few exploits in there and generally didn't work, but a few people relied on that anyway. And the first really, really major change, which also went along with the bump of the version number to the um, comfortable sounding 1.0, from the Odo whatever releases was to switch to block and queue. So block and queue is a piece of infrastructure we have in Linux. It's sort of the block layer, or rather the new version of the block layer. So before that, our, our application, our file system, our block device node more or less called straight into the driver. So it filled out a little bio structure that uh, describes every block IO and dispatches that straight to the driver, which is, well, very low overhead calling convention for sure, but it also meant that every driver written to that interface needs to do a lot of work. And that the prime user of that interface in Linux traditionally was remapping drivers. So if you do a software RAID or a volume manager, those were the drivers written to that interface. And we always had another layer called the request layer that sits there. We've got the block and queue, which did uh, a lot of work that I'll get into on the, on the next slide that really helps with block drivers. But once PCIe flashcards started showing up, the performance of that alt layer was just too bad for people to use it. So they started duplicating lots and lots of bits um, of the infrastructure and uh, we had to act. So first prototype in 2011, we, we got this new block and queue layer, which uh, was designed as a replacement of the request layer. And so what it does is it splits and merges IO requests because whatever the application the file system submits might not be what the driver really wants. And the, the easy case you can think of is you're doing really large IO, but your, your, your device can handle smaller I.O., so it needs to be split. The other is you have a stupid file system not looking at any XT, whatever developers, that just submits a lot of very small I.O. for what's actually a contiguous big I.O. So we're merging that back together. Um, and it has a couple other interesting helpers. So it uh, manages multiple submission and completion queues. So this whole spreading of I have N queues available and M CPU cores, how do I perfectly spread them so that we're having one as local as possible. It's taken care of. We've got a, a command ID or tag allocator, which is actually tied into the management of the per IO data structure. So for every possible outstanding command, we've got a pre-allocated data structure, both for the common block work and a driver specific part, which is indexed by our command ID. So there's one very, very easy to use bitmap allocator that gets you all the data you need for your IO and there's no no massive memory allocations, and so on and so on. And as I said, we first got this in, in 2011, uh, merged it into the Linux kernel three years later, and initially used it for the Word.io block driver. And then later that year, we converted the SCSI layer over to op, um, optionally use it. And I did a lot of work on that because it really helped with performance on things like SRP or high-end rate adapters that were really limited by the old way we've done it. And then in the next year, uh, Linux 3.19, we converted over NVMe. 
And by now, we've got another 10, 12, or maybe even 15 drivers. So the latest one I saw converted over just two days ago was the IBM S390 DSD driver. So even mainframe technologies from the 70s is now using our best and fastest infrastructure. And in general, we didn't have to do much work on, on block and queue to fit NVMe in, but there was one really interesting thing where NVMe differs from most of the block storage we're doing in Linux, and that's the way it describes data transfers for DMA. So what NVMe's got is a concept of PRP, um, physical region pointers, whatever. Um, and the whole idea is it's not a scatter gather list as most IO does where you have an offset in the length, but it only has offsets. So you can't describe a data transfer with one descriptor that spans a page and a page in that sense is actually an NVMe concept. It's the same concept as the page in a typical operating system. So usually 4K, but it's a different setting. So they don't have to be the same. And in fact, in Linux, they or usually, but not always, because our NVMe page size is always 4K, while the system page size might be larger at 8, 16, 64K. But this means that, for example, if we've got a transfer where we have two pages that are contiguous, for NVMe, we actually have to set two PRP entries for it. Well, in this scatter gather list, the length would just increase. And that was something the Linux blog player didn't really expect. So we, we had to get new code in there um, that basically tells the merging code in block and queue is like don't merge the IOs together if they would span multiple pages. And um, well, we got that in. Um, we rewrote it later and it was buggy for a while. But in the end, it was really useful because it turns out there were a couple other drivers that had the same sort of limitation and worked around it by, by bounce buffering and doing weird things. So all the RDMA, not all of them, so Mellanox now has a memory registration type for RDMA that supports gather gather lists as vendor extension, but all the other RDMA memory um, registration schemes have the same limitation. They're basically using the the same data structures as PRPs and used them even earlier. They just didn't have a fancy name for it. And the Hyper-V virtualized driver for Microsoft, uh, Hyper-V in Azure, also has the stra same strange limitation in there. And well, in the meantime, NVMe had actually grown support for scatter gather lists. I guess a lot of people complained very loudly, and the rumor was it was the array people that probably can't as easily fix their stack as we could. So NVMe 1.1 now has HGL support, but it's optional, so very few devices actually support it. And it's only supported for I.O. commands. So when you think of I.O. commands, it's the read and the write, and, well, a few others that don't matter. But all the classical admin setup stuff uh, had to be PRPs. Well, except enter NVMe fabrics a little bit later, where now everyone uses SGLs, but they're different SGLs, just to make it complicated. And we've got we've got patches out there for SGL support in Linux. We we had the first one a couple years ago, but it didn't come with benchmark numbers and wasn't quite as pretty. But now another engineer started on it and actually backed it up with numbers. And as soon as we've got actually larger contiguous transfers, at least 16K, obviously the SGLs win because they're much more efficient to describe that. While on the other hand, for example, for 4K transfers, the PRP will always be more efficient because it's smaller. So we're, we're doing some more fix-ups to do the perfect detection of these thresholds, and then we will use whatever fits better if the hardware actually supports SGLs. <laughs> And well, after we've done the block and queue switch, the usual small tripling in of features continued. So we got support for T10 protection information uh, in February 2015. A little bit later, we got support for the controller memory buffer. So that's a little piece of memory in a PCIe bar that the controller can expose where you can place data or submission queues entry entries in. And we have the basic infrastructure. There's only submission queue entries in there. A lot of people really want to use it for PCIe peer-to-peer -peer transfers eventually, but we're still missing the overall infrastructure for that higher up in the PCIe layer for discovery and higher up in the I.O. subsystems to describe 
physical memory that's not mapped into the kernel virtual address space. So there, there's a lot of heavyweight infrastructure going on that before we can make full use of that. We've got support for a persistent reservation API. So that, that's something I did for a PNFS layout that was primarily targeted to SCSI, but has been extended to NVMe as well. So the applications can use IOCTALs to do persistent reservations without doing weird SCSI path-through tricks that break more often than not. And another really interesting thing is support for Apple devices. And now people might say, well, it's NVMe, right? You should support every device. Well, you haven't talked to Apple. So Apple came up with the idea of building an NVMe device where they used the wrong class code because it was big Andean instead of little Andean as in the NVMe specification where you could not do 64-bit MMIO reads, but had to split it into two 32-bit MMIO reads, and you could not use the queue depth more than one reliably. But uh, all of that would have been easily caught if they had just run the freely available NVMe conformance test suite, but apparently they didn't because it doesn't run on macOS. So uh, <laughs> we had to work around that a little bit. And uh, the other thing is we got basic SRIV support. So the single root I.O. virtualization allows a PCI device to create virtual subfunctions, which if you're in Linux are just like any other PCIe subfunction. So you can either use them in your hypervisor host or assign to guests. In other OSs, you can only assign them to guests. I have no idea where they put in that arbitrary limitation. But uh, yeah, so you can create virtual little NVMe subfunctions which at that point are really basic. Now that we have NVMe 1.3, since, uh, since a couple months now, there is actually a much bigger NVMe virtualization specification that actually allows you to do useful things with these SRIOV functions and manage them in a vendor independent way. But we've not implemented that quite yet. Uh, the next big change after the block and queue move, which was uh, started early last year, actually really at the end of 2015, was that we moved away from having the NVMe driver, which we did before, to more of a subsystem model, which is um, pretty similar to what we're doing in SCSI. So, it, uh, so the first thing we did was actually copy SCSI for a method. And the method is that we started to split away, split out the upper level, which uh, fills out a little command structure that describes the NVMe command we're doing, then uses a pass-through layer, which then goes down to the actual driver that deals with the hardware or transport, because uh, we were going to get some more of these transports pretty soon. And the way we've done this in SCSI for the last 10, 15 years, I guess, it's more than 10 years, about 15 years, is that we've used the concept of a block layer pass-through. So the same request structure that the block layer builds up to pass the files to more application I.O. stuff, we abuse a little bit and take it as a pass-through command that has a pointer to the fully initialized command structure, so SCSI CDB or NVMe submission queue entry, and we can use all the existing queuing infrastructure to handle both cases with the same piece of code. And that allowed to split out the little PCIe driver from, from the common NVMe code, allowed us to support the Fabrix transports, which we're going to go to next. And the other th interesting thing it allowed us to do is support different I.O. command sets. And now some people might say there is no other I.O. command set. Bill hasn't got his key value store through yet, even if he's talking about it. Well, there is. It's just not in the standard. So the the open channel light NVM SSD people, and Matthias is not here, I guess. Nope. They've come up with their own NVMe command set for open channel SSDs, and we actually have support for that in Linux, where we do an FTL in the host and then in inject the low level, very low level NAND, NAND operations in specific non-standardized NVMe commands, and that sort of structure has really helped with supporting that as well. And um, yeah, so now with NVMe over Fabrics, uh, we've done, first we've done a move. So before that, we had the NVMe driver in, in two little files and drivers block with all the weird random block devices that are not SCSI or ATA. And now that we were going to grow a lot more files in NVMe, we decided it's worth to have its own directory. And then we split out a new NVMe core module from the existing NVMe module, and that 
kept its NVMe name. It didn't become NVMe PCIe just for uh, backwards compatibility reasons because you can't just change people's driver name. They'll, they'll get a little upset. And if you're on PCIe, you'll just need these two little modules. So you've got your low-level PCIe driver and you've got a common shared core code. If you're on, on Fabrics, there's actually another layer inserted because we have a common Fabrics library. So there's a fair amount of code that's common between all the Fabrics transports and not shared by PCIe. So we've got another got another little module for that. And all of that went on for a couple of months and finished in June 2016 when we published the, the NVMe over Fabrics code, basically the day after the specification went public because we've been working on that quite a bit. And if we look at, at Linux 4.12, let's move that away, it's a little loud. So we've got, we've got all these different bits of the, the NVMe driver. And the funny thing, it turns out, the biggest part is not the core driver, but the NVMe over Fabrics fiber channel driver, which we got late last year. And it's slightly bigger than the actual real core code, which is about 4,000 lines of code. Then we had another optional bit in the core driver, which is the SCSI translation, which is uh, not much smaller than the actual core NVMe code, despite not actually doing anything but translating around a bit. We got rid of that in Linux 4.13, so I wanted to have 4.12 so we can see the numbers. Then we've got a little bit of optional code for the open channel SSDs, which if you pull it in, it's in the core module. We've got a pretty tiny, again, Fabrics library at just above 1,000 lines of code. And um, we've then got the PCIe driver, which uh, is about 2,300 lines of code. It's still pretty small for a Linux driver. And the RDMA driver, which is even smaller. So it's, all in all, it's still a pretty tiny subsystem. In fact, if you count lines of code, if we include our NVMe over Fabrics target, so the controller side implementation, all our NVMe related code is still smaller than the OFED Windows uh, PCIe driver. And well, yeah, as I said, in the meantime, family's grown a little bit. So we got the fabric support first posted in June 2016, then merged in July. We got the fiber channel support in the end of last year. And well, the next interesting thing is that we put a little lock on your little NVMe devices by getting TCG Opal support, which supports authentication for the device and full disk encryption got that, that code from Intel, so now you can use your TCG-enabled devices with Linux out of the box. No more weird user space tools that generate in a DramaFS files or whatever. Does the proper unlock on a suspend from RAM and from disk, which is pretty important if you want to have your system back working without, uh, with a disk. And the interesting thing, or maybe not interesting if you're used to Linux development, is that of course we didn't at all add all of that code to the NVMe driver, but we have a common little module in the block layer that contains all the low level PCG Opal functionality. And we have not even 50 lines of code to wire it up in NVMe. And uh, a couple months later, I did the same wire up for ATA disks. So the same code will now work not just on your NVMe device, but on your SATA device as well. And in theory, also on your SCSI devices, except that as far as I know, there is no single uh, SAS or fiber channel or whatever device that actually implements TCG Opal. And well, so the next big interesting thing is optimizing things. Uh, so if we look at the traditional I.O. flow of any driver, and thanks to Damien Lamole, from whom I stole this beautiful graphics and a few more later on, is uh, so the traditional way we execute block I.O. or network I.O. or any I.O. is interrupt driven. So we go down the whole stack, um, submit our command, let the device execute it, and let the device generate an interrupt when it's done. And then we get a context switch, and we jump all the little layers up again. Turns out, that with NVMe and a fast enough device, this was starting to be a bottleneck. So we had optimized a lot in block path. And uh, somewhere around the time when we did the blocking, we optimized even more in it. And we needed to figure out what we can do instead. So what we looked for instead was to introduce a polling mode. The networking people have been doing some of that. User space drivers have been doing some of that. 
So in Linux 4.4, we got the initial pull to I.O. mode. So uh, Stephen talked a little bit about that in his talk today, so you might have seen some of that. So we've got a flag and a couple of new system calls that are basically the extended version of the extended version of the extended version of read and write. We keep adding more of those. I added two generations of them, by the way. <laughs> Uh, where you tell it's a high priority command, and if it's a high priority command, we're going to poll for it. And in, in this very first version, we started polling as soon as you submitted the I.O. to make sure we don't ever lose any of that I.O. So with the beautiful DRAM-based NVMe card I have in my test lab, we got our, um, we got our latency for 512 byte reads down for six uh, microseconds to four and a half. And also got a lot less jitter if you look at it. So that was pretty nice. The only really major downside of this scheme is you're always using 100% of your CPU while you're polling, which is good for Intel because they can sell you more CPU, but it's not really very efficient. So um, a couple of releases later, we got a scheme called the hybrid polling. And basically what we're doing is after the I.O. submission, we don't start polling, but we start polling later. And that sounds very easy, except for the fact that you need to figure out when do we start polling. So the big part of that was building an infrastructure that tracks your average I.O. Uh, completion times and starts polling when we're halfway there in the first version. And that was pretty nice because it drastically reduces um, the CPU usage. So we've got 100% CPU usage, if we go to the adaptive hybrid polling scheme, which is the one we ended up with, we're, we're down to 58% um, of the CPU used for polling because we're only polling a little later. And if you look at the latency graphs, we're actually getting exactly the same performance as that. It turns out this is still not very optimal, but it's a very safe first guess because you're very unlikely to miss any of that I.O. unless your I.O. sizes are drastically different. So the next thing that, that Stephen, who gave the talk before now, added a new mode where we start polling just before the expected uh, I.O. completion time. And who would have guessed that uh, provides a lot more savings on CPU cycles, almost down to the same amount of CPU usage as the interrupt-based one? So I'm really excited about that. But at the same time, we'll probably have to improve our um, I.O. completion time estimation to be bucket-based for different I.O. sizes and so on and so on for this to become production ready. And the other interesting polling thing that we don't have in the kernel yet, which, which Sagi, one of our co-maintainer, has been working on, is, a, is an optimistic polling. So this polling is interesting if you've got someone synchronously waiting for your I.O. So your user space database that's waiting for exactly that I.O. But if we're using Linux as, say, an NVMe or SCSI target device, where we get our DMA ops in and NVMe ops out, we don't really want to poll for a specific I.O. because there's lots of them. So what we came up with a scheme where we have a thread that polls the completion queues of both the RDMA device and the NVMe device and just reaps I.O.s as long as we can and then sleeps for a while and goes back to it, which still allows to avoid all the interrupts and do pretty efficient processing of the IOs. It just turns out fine tuning this is pretty hard. So we don't have it in yet, but we're looking at that for one of the next kernel releases. Well, in the meantime, last year's drivers getting older, getting fatter, lots of exciting new features. So the, the, the one I really liked was the range deallocate support. So if you look at the NVMe deallocate support, command or the ATA trim command or the SCSI unmap command. They all don't just contain a single LBA range that, that is unused now, but they contain a few ranges. Each of them has a slightly different format, but the concept is the same. And it turns out the Linux BIO structure that the FOSM used to submit I.O. is very much built around the fact that it contains the start offset and the length. So that, that concept didn't fit in very well. Well, our block and queue merging layer came to help, so I did a little hack to that, that basically the request can always have multiple BIOS, and in that case, we could have used them for that fact, which provided really big speed ups to applications that do a lot of deallocate operations. So that was really nice. On well-built 
devices, there's basically no performance overhead of that anymore. On other devices, not looking at Intel, it's still pretty severe because their deallocate performance is so bad. So uh, still depends if you want to use it or not because it's device dependent. Then now that NVMe is moving into the client space, so how many people have you already got an NVMe device in your laptop? How many of you are running Linux on it? <laughs> awesome. Yeah, once, once you've got the NVMe device in your laptop, you start caring about power management. You probably don't in your server, but the one exciting feature that's in NVMe is the autonomous uh, power state transition support. So you basically give the device a little table about which power state to enter after it's been idle for how long, and then the device is gonna do automatic transitions between those to make sure it's always using power, but it's still a while with not too much latency. So. Uh, we added that support in early 2017. It turns out a lot of devices broke because of that. And uh, people were only testing it with the Intel Windows RSTE driver, which had really weird policies for it. And once we used Linux, uh, things started falling apart. So the worst combination was Samsung devices and Dell laptops, which uh, basically was a guarantee to break loose. It might have been part of their, their PCI root setup as well. And, well, now we have a blacklist of a couple devices where we can't use that, but the other ones are really happy about it. And then we got another feature I did, the host memory buffer support. So after we had the controller memory buffer two years earlier, we now have a host memory buffer. And uh, that name sounds very fancy for having a really cheap device that doesn't, doesn't have any or very little DRAM and wants to steal it from the host. So what the driver basically does is it allocates a big chunk of memory gives it to the device, gives it a DMA address for it, and says, here, you can use that poor device. Your parents didn't even give you any DRAM. Well, let's have some from me. And um, this was just the, the catching up on the old features. And once we got NVMe 1.3, um, we started adding all the exciting new features. And some of them we even added before NVMe 1.3 went public because the way NVMe works, once a technical proposal, which is the individual bits that get into the new standards version are ratified, we're allowed to implement it. So the first one we got was the set doorbell buffer feature, which uh, sounds a little weird and might make more sense if you have the other name that was proposed for it, which was para-virtualized NVMe. So if you've got a virtual NVMe device in your hypervisor that's exposed to, to the guests, it's a very nice idea because every modern OS has an NVMe driver and things will just work. It just turns out that any sort of traditional device that does a lot of MMIO operations, so memory mapped IO operations, um, leads to pretty bad performance because every MMIO write is a trap from the guest into the hypervisor. So to get good performance, you want to avoid that by just using uh, a piece of memory instead. And the one scheme that really works well with that is Word.io, like the Linux transport for virtualized drivers. And we Linux people love it. It just turns out other people don't. So for Windows, you will always need a third-party driver and it's a pain or whatever. So some people at Google came up with this really cool idea that they're going to use the event you went like, like the buffer mechanism from Word.io and retrofit it into NVMe. And that gives really nice performance numbers. It's just they sent us a patch for it at a point where it wasn't standardized. We were like, uh-uh, go to the NVMe working group. We won't have a standardized version of that. It's a cool feature, but uh, as a random underspecified vendor extension, I don't think we can have that in the driver. So it took about another year, and we got a technical proposal in NVMe that standardized it, and we've got it supported now. So that's pretty cool. Um, the next one is we got UUID identifiers. So this is the fourth generation of uh, identifiers in NVMe. NVMe 1.0 did not have any sort of global unique identifier for the namespace. So if you're coming from the SCSI world, that's the device identification VPD page. And it wasn't then <coughs> there. So NVMe 1.1 added a 64-bit um, IEEE assigned identifier, which solved the problem, but it's generally still way too small for the typical use cases. So NVMe 1.2 added a 128-bit <laughs> version of it. It just turns out that the IEEE 
uh, um, identifier is not very good for software-defined storage because it requires a vendor prefix and then a statically handed out number inside of that. And if you're just shipping a Linux-based controller that random people can configure, it's A, very hard to get a vendor prefix, and B, very hard to make sure people don't accidentally use the same one. So what SCSI did a couple years ago is they added a new UUID identifier, which uses the RFC 4122 randomly generated UUID as an identifier. And we added that to NVMe as well and built a little bit of infrastructure that when we have to add another identifier type, uh, we can reuse it for that. And then we got support for uh, the streams feature, which we're actually not really using as streams. So it turns out we build an build an uh, infrastructure where the application tell, can tell the kernel if it's hot data, cold data, medium cold data, really cold data. And we're passing that down the block IO stack and then the NVMe driver all the way down will try to allocate a few streams and stash it into that, which uh, seems to work okay for some people, but it would have been much easier to just pass these hands on to the device. Well, I mean, we, we had a bit of a big fight in the committee, and the, the, the thing that we're doing in the Linux API is something we Linux people would have loved to just pass to the device, while well, the people that argued for streams was like, well, it's not just about hot and call, we want to separate different data streams, but we can't really use that easily because it's very hard to pass that sort of stream ID all the way through the I.O. stack, through all the remappers and file systems, so we ended up basically implementing the scheme we wanted anyway and translate between the streams at the lowest, uh, the, the, the schemes at the lowest level of the stack. And um, last but, no, nah, that's the wrong way. And last but not least is my favorite current project, uh, multipathing. <coughs> Starting in NVMe 1.1, NVMe gained that feature that your controller is not your controller anymore, but your subsystem, and then the subsystem has controllers. So basically, you can build one NVMe device that has two PCIe connectors. Both of them are called the controller, just to confuse everyone who thinks of that PCIe device as the controller, but the whole thing is the subsystem. And you can access both of these controllers independently, either from two systems, which would be the traditional shared storage use case, or you can access it by two different ways from the same system. And the typical use cases for multipath access are aggregating the bandwidth over multiple connections. Well, that doesn't really make sense on PCIe where you can just add a couple more lanes. Um, you are in there for redundancy, which you're typically doing for network attached storage. Doesn't really make sense if you've got a single little device that sits inside of your computer and just has two different PCIe connections. Or you can do it for locality of access, which makes a little more sense. As I say, you have a dual socket system and you want a PCIe connection to each of them and make sure your I.O. stays local and doesn't go over the interconnect. But in general, the, the PCIe NVMe multipathing didn't get all that much use. It's a bit of a fringe feature that's supported by some high-end enterprise controllers, but has very few users. It, uh, it became interesting with NVMe Refabrics when we've now got network storage where the whole redundancy and load balancing becomes interesting. And that makes me always think of driving from San Francisco to San Jose and then you're at that split of 101 and 280 and it's like, which one do you take? You'll need the most up-to-date information of which of your paths is, is actually going to be the good one right now. And that's what a TP that's currently doing in NVMe is trying to solve for NVMe, not for 101. And it's called ANA, the asynchronous namespace access, which, uh, as the name suggests, is the logical equivalent of Alua and SCSI for all these people that love dealing with SCSI arrays. And the idea is that for each controller in namespace where, where the, control, the controller is telling the host, is this an optimized path? Is this a path that works but is not optimized? Is this a path that's currently offline and can't be used at all? And we're getting notifications for that and then the host will decide, um, am I gonna route it through my active path right to the storage device? Am I going through the other path where we might have to do some IO shipping on the other end but it will still work? Or do I better not send that IO at all? And if we look at the, the existing SCSI multipathing in Linux, we, we basically got a layer 
between SCSI and the I.O. submitter that's called Device Mapper Multipath. It's a little module, stackable block driver module that decides which path are we going to send things down. And it's a little bit messy because the information about the state comes from the SCSI layer, so we have to communicate that up to the other layer. And to make it even more complicated, a lot of the decision making and path probing is actually in a user space daemon. So there's a lot of interaction between different components that should be separate. And this, and the device handlers are a modular piece of the SCSI layer, yeah. So I could have made this even more complicated. And what I'm trying to do in NVMe is to pretty much cut all of that out. So once we've got the NVMe driver, we know which, which namespace IDs on the controllers refer to the same thing because NVMe is relatively strict about the identifiers, not perfect, but way better than SCSI. And the way that, that ANA is built, it, it builds on the typical NVMe concepts for that, like asynchronous event notifications, log pages that are all really nicely handled by the driver. So the driver always has the full picture of what's going on. And the other nice thing in NVMe is NVMe doesn't do partial completions of IOs, unlike SCSI. So a command is either done or not. And because of that, we can actually literally bounce I.O. between the different NVMe controllers with no measurable overhead. It's just another 60 x86 instructions and two more cache lines that we're touching. So it's way better than using device mapper multipath on top of NVMe, which some people are trying to do. And this adds up to five to six microseconds. And if you looked at my previous numbers, if you're polling, that's the time we need for the whole I.O. in NVMe right now. So it's basically doubling your excess latency. And the other really nice bit is you don't need to do a setup in user space with a config file and UDIF rules. It's like the kernel driver just creates another node that gives you access to that namespace, a unique identifier through any of the available paths. And I'm pretty much done now. There's a couple nice references, but. It's pretty much only used for fabrics. So it will work for PCIe too, but the main use case is fabrics. Well, you, sh you, you should not use both at the same time because your upper layer will never see an error then. <laughs> but I mean, it Yeah, and we, we had a lot of arguments about that. It just turns out there's basically no code to do the multipathing, right? So the, the, the big, big part about multipathing is, is just discovery of the topology and reacting to the events for topology changes. And that is completely transport specific. That's what we have, say, in the device handlers in SCSI right now. And the part that the device member multipath does right now is basically it clones the request, it clones the BIOS, so it does a lot of memory allocations to deal with the fact that SCSI can do partial completions and we have to partially retry it. But the actual implementation of doing a pass selection and a failover, it's less than 100 lines of code, so I have no problem with having that duplicated. And a couple of the helpers in the block layer to deal with that go in the block layer. So it, there, there is common code, but in general there just isn't much code. The whole multipath implementation is less than 2,000 lines of code, out of which most is discovery. Yeah. And I mean, SCSI, as I said, is a little more complicated, mostly because of partial completions, also because historically people did winter specific multipathing implementations. So before Lua came out, there was an EMC way of doing it, an HP way of doing it, a LSI logic way of doing it, and we had to support all of that. Well, for NVMe, we've already t t told Huawei, it's like, get lost, join the NVMe working group on ANA. We don't want a winter specific way of doing it. So do you envision decrypting the the device mapper multipath and deprecating Well, it's not going away, right? People have their existing SCSI setups, but I don't want people to use it on NVMe, and I'll make sure it won't be usable with ANA because we're not going to expose the information to upper layers.
Yeah. Yeah. It's just for the shiny, cool new stuff. Use the shiny new cool coat, and for your legacy setup, you're stuck with what's there. Well, so I mean, it, it's a flex field, so we have a couple other flex in there that are pretty exciting and could be a talk on their own. But, but the whole idea is, in a typical application, you have foreground and background I.O., right? So think of a simple lock structure database where your main workload is writing to the lock. That's high priority. You really care about your transaction commit because you're going to reply to the network and your records need to be on disk. And then you go in the cleaning phase where you can just do background operations and your your active main logging thread will have the high priority bit set and pull, and the other one will just run in the background, interrupt driven. Um, see, so an initial version of, of our file lifetime hands actually abused fields in that bit. We decided on a different interface in the end that, that is a little more general, but yeah, we could use more fields for that. We just want to have reasonable semantics before. We don't want to throw random special cases in there that keep accumulating. How do you manage all the quirks and bugs? <laughs> Let me open my source file. <laughs> Well, well, I mean, it, it, it depends, right? I mean, right now, the quirks aren't all that bad. So we've, we've got the Intel quirks. They're, they're actually not really quirks. They're just behavior that's beyond the standard that they really want to do. So they want IOs not spread a certain boundary. We finally actually got that standardized in NVMe 1.3 as a trivial little 16-bit field in the identify data. Um, they, they guarantee they're zeroing out everything if you do a deallocate, which is not guaranteed by the standard. Then, well, we've got a couple devices that, that can't enter the deepest power state, and we've actually got another quirk list that's not based on PCI IDs, but the identify string for that, because all the Samsung devices, a lot of Samsung devices have the same PCI ID, but actually behave differently. Um, we have a QMU virtual thing that, that crashes if you use a new identify command that was only added in NVMe 1.1. Um, we've got a few adapters that, that need a little delay after reset before you're checking they're ready. We've got the completely fucked up Apple devices. So uh, we've got a new Samsung device that you can't drive with a high Q depth. So it keeps accumulating, but it's nothing new in Linux, right? The HCI driver looks much worse than the USB storage drivers. So we've been, or, or SCSI for that matter, yeah. So we've been doing that long. And I mean, at some point, we might say this drive is too broken, we're not going to support it, or we'll have a copy of the driver, but so far, it's little bucks here and there that can be worked around. Yep. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll logically implement the portable one, but it will have a workaround, and then as the PCI IDs come along, we add multiple yeah. PCI IDs to take that type of Yeah, but I mean, this is. For the disks and tapes and CD ROMs. Yeah. Yeah. But, and I mean, the same. I mean, look at, look at HCI. HCI is the same model as NVMe. It's a common, common spec with a common PCIe class code and like five gazillion vendors implementing it. And that quirk list in HCI is two pages long. <laughs> and the NVMe one will grow to that too. It does, but we try to keep them out of the fast path in general. Yeah. 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 
Well, if we had to do something for the fast path, life wouldn't be so fun. We'd probably have a different version of the fast path routine that we select at setup time, but I hope we don't have to go there. For HCI, we didn't. HCI quirks are still all in the setup path. There's tons of them, but they are out of the fast path. <laughs> So, thanks everyone.